Previously on Follow the Leader. Today, we're playing Arcane Academia by Thomas Herbertson, with art by Annie Johnston Click. For those of you who are new to the game, here are the basics. In Arcane Academia, you play a group of students at a magical academy, companions to the tumults and turmoil of a day in the life of wonder and whimsy. Bond over meals together, attend arcane lessons, socialize during your free time, and go on daring, mischievous escapades at night. The person that I have here... Um, this one is Soleil, pronouns he, him. Um, the way that I've described him is he's fully wound in thickly padded protective gear, like think uh, overalls or coveralls or some such, mended enough times to become a patchwork quilt at least a quarter of an inch thick. The stature suggests someone on the shorter end, about 5'2", um, who still has a very tall spine for their hidden frame. They don't slouch at all. Um, they have bright green eyes that glint out from above a face covering and below a train engineer's cap, with goggles perched atop the brim, with spiky tufts of straight black hair sprouting out from either sides of their cap and pale ears poking out. Um, finally, they've got thin, dexterous fingers protruding out from their fingerless utility gloves. So, more like industrial, like workhorse kind of person, as opposed to the, the fancier, less calloused types. So. I'm playing Aster, uh, pronouns are she, they. Look is sleepy eyes, covered almost completely by straight black bangs. Um, she has long straight black hair and dark clothes. She is previously my ghost girl, now coming back as a magic student. I'll be playing Soul Hawk, uh, because I think that uh, the idea of Soul as a magic student is pretty hilarious. Uh, she <laughs> uses she, her pronouns. She has uh, tan skin and close-cropped uh, bleach blonde hair, uh, brown eyes that are, you know, sharp uh, and a sullen demeanor, uh, kind of a little bit sulky, a little bit uh, confrontational. And I think, like, her clothes tend to be uh, more rough and tumble than other folks at the school. Like, she tends to wear... Uh, dark denim and nothing protective like Soleil, but still like clothes that you could get down and dirty in uh, without feeling too conscious of it. We now return to your game, already in progress. think that actually leads us on to the main thing, the arc of the day. So now that we have the reference deck built, uh, we can actually start getting into the course of play. The way that the arc works is we go from d uh, dusk till dawn, or well, dawn till dusk, sorry. I got my time flipped around. Daylight savings is really having fun with me. So hmm. we go from breakfast through coursework on to lunch for your free time to dinner we have some escapades, and then we go to bed for the day. And that's generally the arc of the whole day, or of a session, depending on how you want to take it. So, in this case, we can start on with breakfast. So, here it says, First things first, in what order do you wake up and head out to get your first meal of the day? As you engage with the fiction, introduce your character, sharing something about their mood, habits, or appearance. So, whoever suggested the group play this game or organize the session is the first riser who gets to describe the atmosphere of the morning before anyone else is awake. I think that honor goes to August. <laughs> yeah, Soul is apparently an early riser. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. Yeah, so Soul is the first one of our group up, but I don't think she's the first person in the uh, cafeteria. Um, 
Actually, quick question. Do we do we live here or do we like live off campus like with our parents or whatever? Oh, that's such a good question. I think Soleil probably lives here. I want to live here. Okay, then Sol will live here too. Nice. Yeah, because Sol doesn't have a family to go back to, so... Um, but she's not the, <laughs> the first person in the cafeteria. Uh, there are some other scattered students. Um, I think the morning is... There's definitely a bite, a chilly bite to the air, and the castle like is warm but it's it's a fucking castle there's only so warm you can get um even if you're a magical sentient building or Mm semi-sentient building Mm -hmm. but she drags herself in uh goes through the line to get the food um i think it's kind of a limited spread um think like a hotel continental breakfast maybe Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it's it's a little chilly. Um, I think she's got like a, a denim jacket on, but uh, otherwise she gets her food and she claims a table. Um, nobody really sits down with her until y'all get here. That is such a mood. Uh, I think Soleil is a fairly industrious sort to get up first but how about how about Esther does Esther <laughs> does Esther sleep much <laughs> really uh, Esther probably has a problem of like having completely restless nights uh but also you know being so fucking tired God. um so doesn't get there early or anything like rolls in <laughs> just like looking like a hot mess do you want Aster to be the sleepy head? Uh, sure. Does that change anything? Uh, you get to scramble from bed to breakfast. And I think there's some other things that it plays upon, which is just the coursework right afterwards. Mm. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Then I think with Soleil, part of the reason why they're able to get up like clockwork is because of their little companion. Like, I had the idea of it being, like, a little, like, a four-legged spider kind of situation. Oh, cute. Um, where, like, it just, like, gently tonks them on the head with, like, a little plastic hammer to wake mm-hmm. them up. They've, uh, they've learned, or he's learned that it's difficult to get up without some sort of, like, physical, like, poke me until I wake up kind of situation. I think he tried, like, alarms early on, but then he felt bad because it was interrupting everyone else's sleep, too. So he settled Aww. on this as kind of a halfway um, but yeah, he gets that morning bonk, gentle enough to not hurt, but firm enough to get him like aware that something's hit him. Um, hops out of bed and then switches from like wrapped up in just really extensive pajamas, like shirt, over shirt, robe, slippers, pants, shorts kind of situation into all the protective gear that he usually has his on. Um, coveralls, you know, undershirt, overshirt, <laughs> everything under the sun. Um, after he does that, I think um, he'll pick up his little buddy, put it on sh- on top of his cap, just to balance there, and then uh, shoulder a bag just full of stuff before rushing off to get breakfast. I think for him, he does tend to eat pretty heavily in the mornings, so he's throwing on, like, the bread and eggs and grabbing, like three cartons of juice to get him fueled up for the rest of the day. And he'll slip in uh, right beside Sol and set things down, push aside the face covering, and take a moment just to shove a bit of food in first so he's uh, reduced the night's hunger. Hell yeah. Yeah. That leaves Aster. The final character to enter the breakfast place earns the title of Sleepyhead. Describe the tardy companion scramble from bed to breakfast. So I think it's like Aster laying awake, um, but like fucking around on her phone probably. And then like, you know, you put the phone down you see like, okay, maybe now I can go to sleep. It's like, nope, still can't. Okay. And so then eventually it's just like um, scrambling like, oh shit, got caught up on magic TikTok 
and is now scrambling to um, get ready. So comes in like looking like a wreck. Um, would it be funny if someone like just already had her stuff waiting for her and was just like, "Here you go." <laughs> yes. I love it. Yeah, I do see that happening. It's like, here's your food. So yeah, she would accept that and then just like put her head down on the table and shovel food in. The biggest mood. Side note, I think magic TikTok is abracadabra. Hmm? Aww. <laughs> I'm here for it. Heck yeah. Uh, normally, if this were not the first to go at it, we would have correspondence. So if we had diary entries written or we received mail between sessions, we could share it with the group. Or summarize a letter in brief, if preferred. Um, doing that would allow us to introduce rumors related to the correspondence. But since this is our first go at it, we just get to write out some rumors just in general. So... Rumor has it, we can each write a rumor on a sticky note, providing some interesting possibilities to follow up on. Some examples they give are interesting to trivia in a book, um, eavesdropping on an important sounding conversation, making a steadfast declaration about a thing you're going to accomplish, uh, getting someone who looks down to open up about their troubles, or gossiping with peers for juicy, scandalous, and probably inaccurate details. Hmm. Ooh, what's a good rumor? I think i think soleil read something in one of the library's books about something deeper in the castle a room that no one's quite discovered yet but that definitely exists and has been seen in the past before i think it's one of those cases where someone has rumored that the room has like a powerful item or some treasure in it the exact nature of what's locked up in there is unknown but I think it'll just be referred to simply as the vault. Hell yeah. Sounds good. Um, hmm. I kind of want to chase the, the item of Merrill's. Yeah. So I'm going to create another peer really quick. Um, not give, uh, not give them any, uh, background or anything just yet uh, that might come out and play but uh, Soul heard that Chansey Brown was seen with uh, Meryl's item so okay. something to chase down yeah unclear if uh, she stole it or found it though that is a mood. Uh, what rumor has Aster heard? Or read? Or seen? Um, I want it to be... Can it be related to another rumor? Sure. Sure. Can it build off of Sole Soleil's? That's um, the um, room that no one discovered is um like guarded by some huge horrible beast okay okay um and yeah you have to like or like that and like you have to like do a trial to get to the room or something like that so soleil soleil is like bringing it up and it's like oh i heard that too i heard this about it mm -hmm. yeah Sounds good. Cool beans. Now that we've got some rumors set out, uh, we've got some idle time for idle discussion. So we can go around the circle of friends and let everyone share like an observation or a comment. It could be about the food, the rumors. Uh, we can figure out if we're interested in them, or maybe not. <laughs> I think uh, Aster piling more information onto what Soleil said does excite him a bit. He's like, yeah, actually... I was thinking about how exactly we could explore within the walls and if I could maybe make like a little worm or something that could go between the cracks and start digging around in there before the rooms actually get opened up and defined. Like maybe there's empty spaces or like a little pipe it can follow down in. And if it finds it, it can just come right back and let us know where that is, right? Ooh. He says this with his mouth half full with like <laughs> beans. <laughs> I think... Saul scoffs a little bit 
and says, what makes you think that we can force the school to show us this when everybody, well, I don't know if everybody, but a whole bunch of people probably been trying for years. I don't know. Have they tried what I've tried yet? Well, they probably have, but still, maybe I can learn where they failed, right? I guess. Just kind of moving moving food around her plate. Uh, she's eaten like half of it, but the other half she's just kind of playing with. I guess we can find out. Yeah, and maybe, maybe, and he holds up a finger, maybe if we can figure out what's down there, we could use it to help find your things. At least, you know, assuming that they're hyper-lost and not, like, normal-lost. Well, that might be something, yeah. Looking over slowly at Aster. I mean, you yeah, know. Aster looks guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Aster looking down at the plate, like, yeah, we could really, we could, we could try to find them. I guess maybe it would be easier to talk to Shansi, though. Sort of looking yeah. at him, too. Like, do either of you want to, like, pull her over, or should I, or... Uh, <laughs> I think I think that's me. I think I'm gonna go get to talk to them, pull them over. I think maybe maybe Chancy's like a popular student, so she's at a table with a gaggle of other people. Oh, um, God, yeah, Aster definitely wouldn't want to go talk to her. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, it's one of those situations. Okay, yeah, yeah, she's she's like a queen bee. Nice, yeah, and like Soleil is looking over there, like. He's like, yeah, I could probably talk to them. Are you sure you don't want to go? <laughs> we could all do it together. Yeah, <sighs> sure. Okay. And Astrid will agree to come with you. Astrid's not going alone. <laughs> yeah, that's a move. Yeah, I think Soul Soul will come, but she's more like looming in the background. Okay, okay. Because she's definitely taller than Soleil, so. Nice. Yeah. I think it's one of those situations where, like, he does try to approach too, but everyone else is kind of pulling Chansey's attention in the immediate future, like, front. Mm -hmm. So he's there on, like, the edges, like, hey, hello, hi, but he can't <laughs> really, like, actually break in because he doesn't quite have the presence for it. Uh. God. <laughs> Part of me wants Aster to just be like, hey! Is that how you make friends? <laughs> <laughs> you just walk into the middle of the group. Pay attention to me now. Yeah, I am the main character on the stage. I think it's one of those situations where, like, it could be that the bell rings and there's just not enough time in the morning to actually get to it yet. But there's always more time later in the day, right? Right. So I think that sets our goal for the day. Try to get in contact with Chansey Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. But for now, um, I think they'll put us on to coursework. So after breakfast, each player chooses two classes for their companion to attend. If you're the only player whose companion is attending a class, then instead of playing the mini game that's associated with each of these, you can briefly summarize how the class goes for the table. So we'll start off by comparing schedules. So... Every player uh, selects and shares two classes that they're attending. Um, I think it mentions it earlier, but if we're the only one there, we can make up a few sentences about how that time went. Otherwise, if more than one of us is there, then we can take turns playing out the minigame for each class attended by two or more. So we've got five options to go from, which are loosely associated to each attribute. We've got theory and application, herbal lore, practical evocation, exquisite conjuration, and etiquette insults mm. i think for day one at least soleil would probably go through a practical evocation and herbal lore i think uh soul is gonna go through practical evocation and uh theory and application okay um i think aster does theory and application and, um, oh, and I have to, what class I'm scrambling to make it to on time to so much coursework minigame. Okay. Um, 
And etiquette insults. Okay. Yep, and as a note here, too, for the listeners, uh, the sleepy head gets to decide what class they're scrambling to make it to on time. And they also get to decide which coursework minigame the group plays first. Okay. So, between us, Soleil's at herbal lore alone. Soleil and Soul share practical evocation. Soul and Aster share theory and application. And Aster gets to do etiquette insults on her own. Yep. And Soleil gets to do herbal lore on yep. his own. Okay, then I'll start with that to clear it out. So the class description for herbal lore is that we taste and describe a variety of herbs, spices, and sauces so as to better understand their magical applications. Normally, um, for this one, you'd have, with two players as companions or peers, plumb the depths of gastronomancy. Um, the mini game that's associated with it is that you'd do some food and eating in the physical world, normally. So the idea is to get a collection of five herbs and spices in front of them, with advanced practitioners introducing sauces to serve as tinctures and potions. Basically, we want to make sure that either we're fine to grab things that we grab from our pantries, or we get permission for them otherwise. But in lieu of those, we can also use imaginary substitutes if possible. We want a spread of them from salt to other things like gochujang or um, other things that you may not normally use in most of your cooking. Um, when doing the game, if we had the people for it, we'd take turns providing the name and the description of the herbs, then consume pinches or small dollops of it to describe the effects, including flavor profile, a memory that it conjures, and then possible applications, whether medicinal, culinary, or, or magical. Uh, it can also reflect uh, physical experiences of the ingredients uh, for blends, and your own character's perspective on it, as well as magical creativity appropriate to the situation. And then as everyone else is taking their turn, if they share the same ingredient, they could also sample a small portion to share their own experience and consider the reaction to it. Uh, I think in this case, since I'm doing it alone, uh, Soleil here probably would stick to fairly basic things. So I think they don't go further out than, say, like the salts, the basils, the herbs, um, like probably mugwort at most. Um, they're not a super complex person when it comes to magical ingredients, per se. Uh, they do try to use that sort of thing in enchantments and in oil applications to make their machines a little more robust, but they themselves actually don't really have a very good sense of taste at all. So I think with him specifically, as he goes through, it's... He's not really surprised, but it's a situation where, like, he has a little taste of something spicy, and to him it's just total dead wall. He doesn't notice at all, where everyone else has at least some form of visible reaction, like tearing up or um, the faces get red. Uh, but at the same time, like, he doesn't have a particular uh, reaction to things that are sweet or to things that are um, otherwise strong in flavor. Like, all of it to him together kind of hits the same effect so he has to ask others and share notes to figure out what exactly it is that that helps him out or what exactly it is that he's not so much a fan of or that he shouldn't use so all in all for him it's a fairly successful day of sharing notes but he doesn't quite get the same experience as the others do um all the same that's the herbal lore do you get uh, a perk spur or create a reference yeah that's a good mention so along these way or along these mini games we can earn perks we can earn spurs and we can earn references so the way that the book explains them is perks are resources we earn for accomplishments privileges or valuable trinkets for performing well academically spurs are shames failures complications desires for revenge or dreams of redemption that are motivated for action we get them for like messy entanglements or getting in trouble or biting off more than we could chew. I think in this case, oh, I think he'll actually get a spur. Um, he's not a very uh, exploratory person when it comes to this stuff, at least. So I think he ends up actually repeating a lot of the same work that others do in this case. And mostly just feels puzzled about like, 
normal experimentation not exactly leading to new results in this case for him. So he's going to try something a little more reckless next time he ends up in something in this situation. Yeah, good, great. Okay. I think then, do we want to do practical evocation next, theory and application next, or etiquette insults? Let's do practical evocation next. Sure. Uh, and then maybe etiquette and insults, and then finish up with theory and application. Sounds good. Okay. Practical evocation. The way it's described is unify esoteric knowledge and physical exertion to manifest magical spells with your peers. So, two or more players playing as companions or peers in a spellcasting exercise class that may contain elements of sports. We get to write out a favorite quotation, lyric, poem, or phrase in an index card, normally. Consider what sort of spell our given quotation would manifest as when we channel our power through it, and describe what we're aiming to accomplish for the group. So... We also have various ways we can deliver this, like passage deliveries and then the effects of their spellcasting, which we can run off of. Um, in this, we would have a bin some distance from the table, or we might do this on our own in a digital space. Um, and we get poetry sport for at least one round. So what we would do is we intone the quotation aloud with a suitably sonorous and magical dictation. We take the index card or whatever, whatever other object and crumple it up and try to toss it into the bin. We can take multiple attempts for this. And then we can detail the effects of the spell attempted, and based on the results of the throw, describe how effectively and successfully we cast it. And this also determines the perks and spurs and potential references that we do. Has everyone got bins at hand? I may need to fetch one. Uh, it's not a bin, but it's something that I can throw, I can aim for. I've got a bin. And I've got some things to toss at it. Let me grab some assorted objects on my desk. Yeah, I've got a crumpled up piece of trash. Um, yeah, we're taking care of it and also casting spells. Yeah. Okay. So, dang, we gotta find some quotes, huh? Me looking up Douglas Adams quotes. <laughs> I have a couple of lyrics um, and like one Stephen King reference that immediately comes to mind. Okay. But I'm trying to decide what the effects would be. I'm looking at all these Douglas Adams quotes and I'm feeling a little bit of nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I've got a quote ready. Okay. So, uh, I think for this one, I think this is a more, like a passionate one, right? The quote that I have in hand, I'll, I'll deliver here. Um, it's a pretty short one. It's, you live and learn, at any rate you live. I've got a card in hand, that I'm going to attempt to flick into this bin that I have over here. I think what Soleil is trying to do is produce some sort of component to keep the spell moving, to provide an energy. So, let's see if I toss it. Yep. And that went totally off course. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! No success. I'll toss one more object that I have here. All right, that landed. Uh, cool. So there's like a hum of energy building in the room. I always like the smell of ozone as indication that magic is happening. Yeah. So we're getting the smell of ozone pretty hard with this with this energy collecting and soul growls this preacher ain't no pacifist so give me dirty knees and bloody lips and what she's trying to do is release an explosive force using that energy as like an offensive spell so i'm going to turn away from my microphone really quick and throw this Aw, shit, it landed. It bounced off of the wall, but it landed. Oh, let's go. Off the backboard. Yeah. <laughs> no scope 360. Nice. Yeah. So um, I think there's this booming force and a shockwave that sends... It doesn't send us flying... But, like, stuff that's not held down and, you know, some small objects go flying 
um, off of the desks and stuff. Some people have to scramble to get their notes back together. But uh, I think it was kind of subdued because, like, maybe the 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 walls absorbed some of the force to keep it from being too destructive to the students around them. But Sol is kind of reckless, so she didn't really consider that before she cast the spell. Nice. Love power. Do we want to try and go for another round? I think that could be fun. Uh, trying to to tag team a different a different spell. Okay. You want to start off this time? Yeah. Um, All right. Let me yeah. think of what kind of spell this quote is uh, working towards. And I'll think of mine at the same time. I'll also search for a good quote. I think. Hmm. Gosh, this is difficult. It is, right? Because I'm trying to think of a way to leave an opening for you to build off of this. Um, but I think Sol intones, uh, he thrusts his fist against the post and still insists he sees the ghost. And the intended effect is like revealing hidden things. Mm. So dispelling like illusory magic, that kind of thing. Hey, so brainwave? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I think Soleil is actually surprisingly ready for this. And so he steps up and opens his hands as he states, words used carelessly, as if they did not matter in any serious way, often allow an otherwise well-guarded truths to seep through. Oh, nice. I think uh, we should throw together. Yeah. So I'm going to turn away from the mic and make my throw. Okay. I just barely missed. So, like, Sol is, like, reaching out with her hands, uh, trying to focus the magic, and the magic just isn't willing, and there's a minor backlash. Like, she has to step, take a step back because the energy, like, almost physically pushes back against her will. That's fair, yeah. I think for Soleil, I managed to land it right in the bin. So he struggles a bit with sort of maintaining the load, but mm -hmm. like kind of not forces necessarily, but produces a barrier of sorts to throw it forward as opposed to it firing fully back. So mm -hmm. I think we still get hit with some of that backsplash, right? Like some of it still does come back at us, but... um it's almost more like a poorly directed explosion as opposed to a complete uh, reflection. Mm -hmm. hey, how does it look when it when it hits us by the by? <laughs> uh, Saul's hair is too short for it to be ruffled, but I think I think there should be some sort of physical manifestation. Like my first inclination is always like a nosebleed or something, but mm. I don't know if that's too cliche. Please feel free to stop me if you think it's uh, too well, cliche. So this is about dispelling or seeing the unseen, right? So mm -hmm. I had an idea that since it's a minor one, it just blasts out one of like Soleil's surface level thoughts. So everyone quite literally hears his voice springing forward from his head going, I wonder what I should have for lunch today. And then going through mm -hmm. some of the options like out loud. Oh, my God. I love that. Um I think Saul's thought, because I, I like the idea of that, you know, being blasted out, you know, um, I think Saul's thought that gets broadcast is much more focused, but it's it's like a background thought. It's it's a background drive and everybody just kind of feels the the drive of I'll find you or I'll find it just the the need to find something mm, like a general desire to search mm -hmm. okay 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 because she's got the the item from meryl that she wants to find and you know she's always like wanting to find the the wizard who killed her family a life made of searching yeah i liked your quote so i think we should create a reference of some kind 
Okay. So with the resources that are picked, I picked one a little arbitrarily, but for these mini games, we get to define it accordingly. They give us each different sets of results that we can choose from. So we could earn a perk if every spell cast we three landed successfully in the basket. I don't think either of us got that one. No. <laughs> we also don't get the spur where not a single one you throw lands successfully in the basket. So we're free from that at least. But um, if another companion compliments us one another's quote, reading selection, oration, or dictation, then we get to create a form of reference. And I think that's any of the uh, the campus, the instructors, or a peer, right? We can make one of those three. Uh, locations are also references, so... Yeah. Um, so if we want to, like, expound, ex expound slash expand on the invocation classroom, we could do that, too. Yeah. I don't know. How are you feeling? I got an idea for a peer in mind, but... I'm down with a peer. Sure. So since we're trying to get closer to Chansey, mm -hmm. um... I think what we've done is we've impressed their number two or her number two. Okay. Now, what would a good name be? Why does my brain just want to, want to rhyme? Hmm, Chancy do it. Nancy. Nancy. I'm fine with that. Nancy something. I don't know what a last name would be. Has anyone got one? Clearwater? Yeah. Fancy. Fancy. <laughs> sure everyone calls her fancy. Pronouns? Sheer? Uh, yeah, let's go Sheer. Okay. Cool. And I think it's one of those situations where, like, she sees us do this, and, like, it's a little bit funny at first, but then I think she also senses sort of the seriousness, seriousness coming from Soul and her, mm -hmm. like, immediate thoughts. Uh, and, like, it's like one thing, it's like, oh, cool, you managed to do this thing, but also, like, there's a little bit of mystery here. What exactly is it that Soul's searching for? Hmm. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, like, she wants to meddle or learn a bit more about it. Sounds good. Okay. That is practical evocation. So next up would be etiquette and insults, right? I think that's where we, the order we wanted to go in next. Yep. Which means... I think that would make sense for that to be the one I'm late to since it's my first class. Very fair. Um, which is also hilarious like, I'm sure the person who is late to etiquette and insults gets uh, to be an example. <laughs> <laughs> um. uh, yeah. So the way that etiquette and insults works normally is one companion attending the class gets to be one of two insulters, or which are students who face off to trade prepared insults. Another one would get to volunteer to be the second insulter, which could be their own companion or another student, a friend or peer or a rival in the class. So they could do either a pre-existing reference or create a new one. Then the third player could take on the role of mediator with an appropriate instructor. Uh, other players outside of that can become the chorus, representing other students in the class as the audience. So this is a game about being mean to each other. So we got to be careful to do boundaries between in-character and out-of-character. Um, mm -hmm. But the insulters get to decide which one has the first say, and the other student gets the last word. Uh, for a disagreement, whoever drank the most water gets to decide. And we take cards, uh, th write three insults out of short sentences apiece, and the chorus can chat with the mediator about the class freely while this is occurring. Uh, some of the insult prompts they uh, have are pretty funny. I like the ninth one, which is, give them some kind and well-meaning advice, smiling emoji. <laughs> um, but there are other ones out there, too, which are a little more direct. Uh, the mediator observes these children as they insult each other and takes notes. Uh, and awards arbitrary marks after all of the insults have been exchanged. So after the insulters write out their insults, they can read them. So they take turns insulting each other uh, with giving the other time to react to how their characters uh, are impacted, essentially, by what's been said. If they want to improvise, they can also rebuke insults they receive and turn them back around instead of reading one of their own prepared ones, and the chorus can react accordingly. Uh, after the last word reads the third one, then the mediator gets to hem and haw and provide feedback. They can give actual critical advice, uh, or they can do other things like, you know, compliment everyone on a job well done, uh, talk about something else entirely, or go to attend someone else in crisis. And then after all that's done, we can check with our companions, uh, the other ones, and see how they're doing, see what their feelings are, if a fight maybe breaks out. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And then we do a safety check afterwards to make sure everyone's fine. I appreciate the fact that they've put in a little bit of time or space afterwards to make sure folks are okay. So that's how the game would normally be run, but I think since you're in this one alone on you, you get to figure out how this class goes. Um, can someone be my best friend? Because I imagine this is a lot of their friendship. Oh. <laughs> oh. Aster and Xander uh, playing with each other in the insults. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, I think with Xander, right? Like, I think they tend to focus a little bit on things that they've learned of you so far that people don't necessarily know, but not so deep to where, like, exposing a secret would be an unpleasant thing necessarily. Mm -hmm. So one of those things where you might get caught off guard by something he says um, off the bat. And then you realize, like, wait, do I do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that a thing that I do? Uh-oh. Uh, I think you'd also go second. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, because I'm just looking at vicious mockery things. Um, so I guess Aster would start out with, um, something physical. So, uh, making an unfavorable, unfavorable comparison to their fashion. <laughs> oh, um, man. and would start, uh, I like this one. Um, words can't describe your outfit. So I'll just throw up. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I think Xander would shoot back with, well, you might not be able to capture its elegance, but at least it's better than all black. Ah. Uh, look, somewhere there's a village searching for their idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they came and knocked on my door. I think they're still looking. Oh, Xander, it's incredible how you can bring such joy to a room just by simply leaving it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ah, but you see, when I come back in, that's when the real applause starts. God. <laughs> and I think Aster looks just like, she's like smiling ear to ear, like loving this. Yeah, I think it'll stick his tongue out. Just like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Shakes a finger, like you. Uh, God, some of these are mean that I'm generating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God. It's always an eternal reference. Oh, well, your mom's so slow it took her nine months to make a joke. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> My god! Damn. I think that would get him. <laughs> <laughs> I, think he just, I think he would just bust out laughing. <laughs> Astrid would also bust out laughing. Just like... Oh, shit. That one's rough. <laughs> That's a rough one. <laughs> oh. Damn, did you mean that? <laughs> uh, Ed asked her, like, no, your mom's a lovely person. God. <laughs> yeah, I think he'll have to admit defeat on that one. Hmm? Jesus, some of these are, are so bad, but that, there's some that are so good. It's spicy. That's spicy. So... Based on that, how do you think you went resource-wise? Did you get any of the three below? You can, generally speaking, you could earn a perk if the mediator chooses you as the insulter who took the most away from the exchange. Um, and the chorus can chime in to try and influence results. You can earn a spur if your companion runs out of the room crying. No, I don't think that happens. <laughs> or you could create a reference if you think you did a good job. I, I think we definitely did a good job keeping temper. Oh, that's the mediator. Yeah, and as the mediator. But, you know, like, we're playing this one fast and loose, so you have freedom, I think, in this case, to decide. I think the tempers were in great check. Yeah. Uh, the mediator's just like, you're supposed to be, like, insulting each other, not enjoying this. <laughs> Who are you people? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's create a reference. Sure. What kind of reference turns up as a result of this? I don't know. <laughs> Could be a new instructor, maybe. Like, who the heck would teach this class and have it be totally taken over by these two clones? Um, yeah, let me scroll back up to instructors. Oh my god, a bard has to teach this class. Yeah, I've got a last name for them if you're if you're up to taking it. Absolutely. Wormwood. Oh, nice. Wormwood. Let's see. So yeah, instructor Wormwood. 
can be they them. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think the bard is also having a good time with this, but they're like, okay, but like in an actual situation, you're gonna have to like hurt someone. <laughs> you have to dig deep. Like y'all, vicious mockery. <laughs> like we're not telling jokes in this class. Maybe these things uh would have hurt someone else, but these two are like I think this is the way they interact. <laughs> I've got a first name. Oh, yeah? Aloysius. Ooh. Oh, my God. Ooh, I gotta see that spelled out. I don't know. God. I, I, I have to... Okay, so there we go. This is what Google says how you spell Aloysius. Aloysius the Vicious Wormwood. Mm-hmm. Love that. Yeah. If you're not crying, they're not trying. How are they looking? Is it too on the nose to make them eccentric? No, I think it makes sense. Maybe lots of clashing colors, like a patchwork sort of thing. Um, Log coat, like a patchwork duster, sorry. That's fair. One of those situations where, like, the rainbow looks wrong on them. It's almost just the way the colors are oriented. It's everything wants to draw your eye to it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I can see them almost being someone who's like literally enchanted their things so you can't quite look away. Hmm. Sounds good. Nice. All right, Miss Chapter Wormwood. We'll take that one. Okay. Then I think that leaves theory and application. Yes. So let me go find that. Which I think all of us will play because I think uh, we can rope uh, Anya into being the instructor. I think uh, Anya is actually. Uh, yeah, I'm taking theory and application. One of, the, one of the companions attending, so I get to be the instructor of this one. <laughs> yeah, you get to be in the instructor. Sorry, I was okay. just reading. Here we are, theory and application. Then, so one player serves as the instructor to impart scholarly wisdom about the magic in the world. Players whose companion is attending the class take on that role as well. Um, other players may play a peer, whether from the reference deck or one that they create fresh, fresh, or abstain from playing the mini game. So. As the instructor, <laughs> oh boy, it's my responsibility to have prepared notes for the topic <laughs> that my lecture is on today. If I don't have them ready, I get to apologize and provide an anecdote from the teacher's life about the events that have caught them off guard. How much I overshare with my captive audience is off to you. Are you the old lady teacher who has a story for everything? Oh, man. <laughs> Do yes. I have to invent a story? Um <laughs> To to further the torture, I could normally roll 2d6, but I'm going to have both of you choose a field and a subject that I need to lecture on today. So there's a table there of uh, 1d6 that you could use here for each of them. Uh, I think, Anya, if you could choose a field, I'll just choose a subject. We'll see if I can improvise something. Sounds okay. good. I would like metaphysical. Metaphysical. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yes. All right. Good start. Good start. Hit me with a subject. <laughs> I'm so sorry. How about a dilemma outlining a moral slash ethical stance? Uh... <laughs> okay. Corey's not going to play with us anymore. No, it's fine. I just got to. Th- I got to think real hard. Do I have my notes ready? Um, I'll figure it out while I explain the rest of these instructions. So, while this is happening, <laughs> Google. Uh, college class <laughs> god it's so real i'm i'm definitely the ta who has to sub in um <laughs> so the students get out a spare index card and during the lecture to come they can take either notes on the metaphysics of magic or whatever the teacher's talking about or they can compose a note to fellow students in the room such as passing on inquiring about or inventing a rumor regarding a peer in class mocking the teacher's foibles complaining about the material being taught telling a bad joke they're actually kind of proud of, making a provocative statement to pick a fight, or trying too hard to seem cool while aiming to impress the recipient. So, as you take turns distracting the teacher, me, by asking questions, exchange any notes you wrote during the lecture. The recipient student may attempt to write a reply and hand the note back before the round of questions ends. After the timer elapses, uh, each student may ask a question of the instructor. The instructor should be sure to compliment the thoughtfulness of the particularly pedantic or annoyingly perceptive students 
as a way to buy themselves time to think of an answer. God, this, this really is just me. Um, the instructor also catches any notes being passed if the recipient has started writing a reply, but has not sent it back by the time that the class's round of question ends. They are at liberty to read both the initial comment and the incomplete reply out to the entire class if they so choose. Fuck uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I think uh, how we should handle the note passing is um, we should do it in Discord and roll a flip a coin basically to see if we get caught. That's fair. Yeah. All right. Meanwhile, I'm cracking my knuckles. Let's see how this works. Metaphysical on the dilemma outlying a moral or ethical stance. Um, I think it will probably be, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ms. Crowhaven that steps up to the front of the room. And she says, Well, I know exactly what it was that we had set out for today, but I thought a little bit about it, and I decided, and she takes the desk of notes that she had, and just kind of like slides them off into a garbage bin on the side. <laughs> I thought it would be a good time to maybe consider the world outside of this. Now we could spend a lot of time talking about, oh, whether or not someone should cast spells of controlling creatures within the forest and maybe even talk about how someone should achieve such a thing. But... We already spend a lot of time handling the reins of magic, so I don't see why we should also worry about the ethics of handling the reins of those creatures in the forest at the same time. But I have a little story for you regarding how exactly all of that went. So, God, I've had this teacher before. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was a distant forest about a state away, and... In my particular case, I had to go tame the white stag. You know, that thing of legend that people are so obsessed with hunting. And I thought, well, if people are so obsessed with hunting it, why don't they ever find it? And my impression was, well, I think I could just go find a normal stag and turn it white. So I started with just that. I did a little bit of searching about to find a particularly normal, bog-standard stag. And those really are a dime a dozen. It was some lord's forest, you know, the ancient kind, ones that have held the land for generations, or so they say. But really, all I had to do was find it, secret it away from the others. And then, when I brought it into the... So... Hmm? You you catch Solanaster passing notes. Uh-huh. Because <laughs> uh, I, I rolled tails. Oh, I didn't roll for mine. Oh, that's fine. It's one it's one exchange, I think, that happens. Oh. Yep. So, uh <laughs> I will give you a bit of grace here and sort of point out to Sol was the one writing the, the note there. Yes, so I will not write a joke note. Saul, did you have a question? Saul kind of looks grumpy and uh, says, I don't get it. Why? Things are just beasts. You know, what? what's the dilemma here? I, I don't get it. This is stupid. Well, you see, I mean, I think that's a very good question to ask. Uh, and people have asked that to me before. But see, the, the, the ethical part of this is, it's twofold. Now, is it really right to just take a creature off of, well, the streets, metaphorically speaking, and change them, the very nature of them, into something that is storied and so communicated and that people will probably take arms up against and kill later if they can find it? And I say, probably it was going to beat its fate during the hunting season regardless, so I may as well give it its time in the sun. Um, she will reach as she steps forward and very carefully collect the two notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as she walks by, just actually suddenly, like she slips them behind her back. Now, 
And I'll probably allow for one more round of this because <laughs> I don't know how long I can keep speaking in this voice. Um, all things so considered. I'll send the note first this time, I think. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, uh, I can actually just, the one I sent before, I can just send that. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Uh, when I spoke to the Lord, I let him know that I'd finally gotten a sighting of it. I uh, cast it from, forward from the temporary coven that I'd set up deep, deep in the fen, and finally let it go. And I did give it something a little in its favor as part of it. I, I gave it just a bit of spark of life, something to make it go fast through whenever the hunting dogs would be out and the, the horns would be blown and all of the rigmarole that comes about with that. So I, myself, had taken the currents of magic and empowered this one being to create the legend that everyone so clamored for. The uh, the white stag, as it were. Uh, now, all things considered, I didn't quite expect them to start setting traps. So, uh, in the long run of things... We got while... caught. Oh, again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> she'll, uh, she'll pause and just carefully pick up the notes again. Um, I think what she does is she, she proceeds to the front. Now, we'll take a little bit for a bit of the side entertainment. <laughs> and like, she, she picks up the notes, she reads them, she laughs, and then she doesn't tell anyone what they were. <laughs> she just kind of lets people form their opinions. But I think that's, uh, I think that's also Belle. <laughs> yeah. So we... Get to ask a question of the instructor. Yeah. Aster's question, because I think Aster was actually kind of listening, uh, was about, like, so if you think we should kill the white stag, but it's this treasure that everyone hunts, does that mean that nothing is truly valuable? Mmm, that truly is something we're thinking about, isn't it? Well... What I think this is, really, is even if it may not be physically real, and she puts that in air quotes, uh, what it is, it's about encouraging the people to get out in the world and look for what it is that they so desire. And if others are empowered to make that thing true, even just for a glance or a gasp or a whisper in the night, I think it's worth giving them something to search for. Thank you. You get a gold star. <laughs> Aw, yay! Um, I don't think Sol asks a question. Um, I think she's just, like, embarrassed about being caught twice. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to take a spur for... Oh, please, by all means. For being embarrassed. Spur, yay! So, and I think, Anya, I think Aster gets a perk. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. So that brings us to lunch. Heck yeah. Lunchtime. Uh, this is a built-in one, but we can take a break for a few minutes, step away from the table or screens, and attend to your body's needs, and reconvene in about five to ten minutes. Uh, I'll read what happens afterwards, just so it's all together. So students who have earned spurs get to choose if they arrive to lunch first, if they stormed out of the classroom, or last, they got a talking to from the teacher. The remainder filter in as a gaggle. By arrival order, we can go around picking options off the list. We can give our opinion on the quality of the meal being served, learn the truth behind a rumor. If it results in substantial new information, we can write a replacement or modify a relevant reference. Pull two references from the deck and choose one with whom to interact, or complain about something that happened during and after that, we can do some free time activities. But I think I'll take the game's advice. Oh, I think it's time for a quick break. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> 